Hi everyone. HMS Victory is a 104-gun first-rate ship of the line of the Royal Navy, ordered in 1758, laid down in 1759 and launched in 1765. She is best known for her role as Lord Nelson's flagship at the Battle of Trafalgar on 21 October 1805. She additionally served as Keppel's flagship at Ushant, Howe's flagship at Cape Spartel and Jervis's flagship at Cape St. Vincent. After 1824, she was relegated to the role of harbour ship. In 1922, she was moved to a dry dock at Portsmouth, England, and preserved as a museum ship. She has been the flagship of the first Sea Lord since October 2012 and is the world's oldest naval ship still in commission, with 245 years service as of 2023. Construction In December 1758, William Pitt the Elder, in his role as head of the British government, placed an order for the building of 12 ships, including a first-rate ship that would become victory. The outline plans were based on HMS Royal George which had been launched at Woolwich Dockyard in 1756, and the naval architect chosen to design the ship was Sir Thomas Slade who, at the time, was the surveyor of the navy. She was designed to carry at least 100 guns. The commissioner of Chatham Dockyard was instructed to prepare a dry dock for the construction. The master shipwright in charge of construction was Edward Allen, son of Sir Joseph Allen, former surveyor of the navy. The keel was laid on the 23rd of July 1759 in the old single dock, and a name, Victory, was chosen in October 1760. In 1759, the Seven Years' War was going well for Britain. It was the Annus Mirabilis, or Wonderful Year, and the ship's name may have been chosen to commemorate the victories or it may have been chosen simply because out of the seven names shortlisted, Victory was the only one not in use. There were some doubts whether this was a suitable name since the previous victory had been lost with all hands in 1744. A team of 150 workmen were assigned to construct Victory's frame. Around 6,000 trees were used in her construction, of which 90% were oak and the remainder elm, pine and fir, together with a small quantity of lignum vitae. The wood of the hull was held in place by six-foot copper bolts, supported by tree nails for the smaller fittings. Once the ship's frame had been built, it was normal to cover it up and leave it for several months to allow the wood to dry out or season. The end of the Seven Years' War meant that Victory remained in this condition for nearly three years, which helped her subsequent longevity. Work restarted in autumn 1763 and she was floated on the 7th of May 1765, having cost £63,176 and 3 shillings, the equivalent of £9.19 million today. On the day of the launch, shipwright Hartley Larkin, designated foreman afloat for the event, suddenly realized that the ship might not fit through the dock gates. Measurements at first light confirmed his fears, the gates were at least nine and a half inches too narrow. He told the news to his superior, master shipwright John Allen, who considered abandoning the launch. Larkin asked for the assistance of every available shipwright, and they hewed away enough wood from the gates with their adzes for the ship to pass safely through. However, the launch itself revealed significant problems in the ship's design, including a distinct list to starboard and a tendency to sit heavily in the water such that her lower deck gun ports were only 4 feet 6 in above the waterline. The first of these problems was rectified after launch by increasing the ship's ballast to settle her upright on the keel. The second problem, regarding the sighting of the lower gun ports, could not be rectified. Instead it was noted in Victory's sailing instructions that these gun ports would have to remain closed and unusable in rough weather. This had potential to limit Victory's firepower, though in practice none of her subsequent actions would be fought in rough seas. Because there was no immediate use for her, she was placed in ordinary and moored in the River Medway. Internal fitting out continued over the next four years, and sea trials were completed in 1769, after which she was returned to her Medway berth. She remained there until France joined the American War of Independence in 1778. 
Victory was now placed in active service as part of a general mobilization against the French threat. This included arming her with a full complement of smooth bore, cast iron cannon. Her weaponry was intended to be 30 42 pounders on her lower deck, 28 24 pounder long guns on her middle deck, and 30 12 pounders on her upper deck, together with 12 6 pounders on her quarter deck and forecastle. First Battle of Ashant Victory was commissioned in March 1778 under Captain Sir John Lindsay. He held that position until May 1778, when Admiral Augustus Keppel made her his flagship, and appointed Rear Admiral John Campbell, first captain, and Captain Jonathan Faulkner, second captain. Keppel put to sea from Spithead on 9 July 1778 with a force of around 29 ships of the line and, on 23 July, sighted a French fleet of roughly equal force 100 miles, 160 kilometers, west of Ushant. The French Admiral, Louis Guillaume, Comte d'Orvillers, who had orders to avoid battle, was cut off from Brest, but retained the weather gauge. Maneuvering was made difficult by changing winds and driving rain, but eventually a battle became inevitable, with the British more or less in column and the French in some confusion. However, the French managed to pass along the British line with their most advanced ships. At about a quarter to twelve, Victor reopened fire on Britannia of 110 guns, which was being followed by Ville de Paris of 90 guns. The British van escaped with little loss, but Sir Hugh Palliser's rear division suffered considerably. Keppel made the signal to follow the French, but Palliser did not conform, and the action was not resumed. Keppel was court-martialed and cleared and Palliser criticized by an inquiry before the affair turned into a political argument. Second Battle of Ushant In March 1780, Victory's hull was sheathed with 3,923 sheets of copper below the waterline to protect it against ship worm. On 2 December 1781, the ship, now commanded by Captain Henry Cromwell and bearing the flag of Rear Admiral Richard Kemp in Felt, sailed with 11 other ships of the line, a 50-gun fourth rate, and five frigates, to intercept a French convoy that had sailed from Brest on 10 December. Not knowing that the convoy was protected by 21 ships of the line under the command of Luca Bond de Buexic, Comte de Guichon, Kempin felt ordered a chase when they were sighted on 12 December and began the battle. When he noted the French superiority, he contented himself with capturing 15 sail of the convoy. The French were dispersed in a gale and forced to return home. Siege of Gibraltar Victory's armament was slightly upgraded in 1782 with the replacement of all of her six-pounders with 12-pounder cannon. Later, she also carried two carronade guns, firing 68-pound round shot. In October 1782, Victory under Admiral Richard Howe was the fleet flagship of a powerful escort flotilla for a convoy of transports which resupplied Gibraltar in the event of a blockade by the French and Spanish navies. No resistance was encountered on entering the straits and the supplies were successfully unloaded. There was a minor engagement at the time of departure, in which Victory did not fire a shot. The British ships were under orders to return home and did so without major incident. Battle of Cape St. Vincent In 1796, Captain Robert Calder, first captain, and Captain George Gray, second captain, commanded victory under Admiral Sir John Jervis's flag. By the end of 1796, the British position in the Mediterranean had become untenable. Jervis had stationed his fleet off Cape St. Vincent to prevent the Spanish from sailing north, whilst Horatio Nelson was to oversee the evacuation of Elba. Once the evacuation had been accomplished, Nelson, in HMS Minev, sailed for Gibraltar. On learning that the Spanish fleet had passed by some days previous, Nelson left to rendezvous with Jervis on the 11th of February. The Spanish fleet, which had been blown off course by easterly gales, was that night working its way to Cadiz. The darkness and a dense fog meant Nelson was able to pass through the enemy fleet without being spotted and join Jervis on the 13th of February. Jervis, 
whose fleet had been reinforced on 5 February by five ships from Britain under Rear Admiral William Parker, now had 15 ships of the line. The following morning, having drawn up his fleet into two columns, Jervis impressed upon the officers on Victory's quarterdeck how, a victory to England is very essential at the moment. Jervis was not aware of the size of the fleet he was facing, but at around 0630 hours, received word that five Spanish warships were to the southeast. By 0900 hours the first enemy ships were visible from Victory's masthead, and at 1100 hours, Jervis gave the order to form line of battle. As the Spanish ships became visible to him, Paul reported the numbers to Jervis, but when he reached 27, Jervis replied, Enough, sir. No more of that. The die is cast and if there are fifty sail, I will go through them. The Spanish were caught by surprise, sailing in two divisions with a gap that Jervis aimed to exploit. The ship's log records how victory halted the Spanish division, raking ships both ahead and astern, while Jervis' private memoirs recall how victory's broadside so terrified Principa de Asturias that she squared her yards, ran clear out of the battle and did not return. Jervis, realizing that the main bulk of the enemy fleet could now cross astern and reunite, ordered his ships to change course, but Sir Charles Thompson, leading the rear division, failed to comply. The following ships were now in a quandary over whether to obey the admiral's signal or follow their divisional commander. Nelson, who had transferred to HMS Captain, was the first to break off and attack the main fleet as Jervis had wanted and other ships soon followed his example. The British fleet not only achieved its main objective, that of preventing the Spanish from joining their French and Dutch allies in the Channel, but also captured four ships. The dead and wounded from these four ships alone amounted to 261 and 342, respectively, more than the total number of British casualties of 73 dead and 327 wounded. There was one fatality aboard Victory. Reconstruction on her return to England, Victory was examined for seaworthiness and found to have significant weaknesses in her stern timbers. She was declared unfit for active service and left anchored off Chatham Dockyard. In December 1798 she was ordered to be converted to a hospital ship to hold wounded French and Spanish prisoners of war. However, on 8 October 1799, HMS Impregnable was lost off Chichester, having run aground on her way back to Portsmouth after escorting a convoy to Lisbon. She could not be refloated and so was stripped and dismantled. Now short of a three-decked ship of the line, the Admiralty decided to recondition victory. Work started in 1800, but as it proceeded, an increasing number of defects were found and the repairs developed into a very extensive reconstruction. Extra gun ports were added, taking her from 100 guns to 104, and her magazine lined with copper. The open galleries along her stern were removed, her figurehead was replaced along with her masts and the paint scheme changed from red to the black and yellow seen today. Her gun ports were originally yellow to match the hull but later repainted black, giving a pattern later called the Nelson Checker, which was adopted by most Royal Navy ships in the decade following the Battle of Trafalgar. The work was completed in April 1803, and the ship left for Portsmouth the following month under her new captain, Samuel Sutton. Nelson and Trafalgar Vice Admiral Nelson hoisted his flag in victory on 18 May 1803, with Samuel Sutton as his flag captain. The dispatches and letters of Vice Admiral Lord Nelson record that Friday the 20th of May a.m., Nelson, came on board. Saturday 21st and moored ship and weighed. Made sail out of Spithead, when HM ship Amphion joined, and proceeded to sea in company with us, Victory's log. Victory was under orders to meet up with Cornwallis off Brest, but after 24 hours of searching failed to find him. Nelson, anxious to reach the Mediterranean without delay, decided to transfer to Amphion off Fushant. On 28 May, Captain Sutton captured the French ambuscade of 32 guns, bound for Rochefort. Victory rejoined Lord Nelson off Toulon, where on 31 July, Captain Sutton exchanged commands with the captain of Amphion, 
Thomas Masterman Hardy and Nelson raised his flag in victory once more. Victory was passing the island of Toro, near Mallorca, on the 4th of April 1805, when HMS Phoebe brought the news that the French fleet under Pierre Charles Villeneuve had escaped from Toulon. While Nelson made for Sicily to see if the French were heading for Egypt, Villeneuve was entering Cadiz to link up with the Spanish fleet. On the 9th of May, Nelson received news from HMS Orpheus that Villeneuve had left Cadiz a month earlier. The British fleet completed their stores in Lagos Bay, Portugal and, on the 11th of May, sailed westward with ten ships and three frigates in pursuit of the combined Franco-Spanish fleet of seventeen ships. They arrived in the West Indies to find that the enemy was sailing back to Europe, where Napoleon Bonaparte was waiting for them with his invasion forces at Boulogne. The Franco-Spanish fleet was involved in the indecisive Battle of Cape Finisterre in fog off for all with Admiral Sir Robert Calder's squadron on the 22nd of July, before taking refuge in Vigo and Farol. Calder on the 14th of August and Nelson on the 15th of August joined Admiral Cornwallis's Channel Fleet off Fushant. Nelson continued on to England in victory, leaving his Mediterranean fleet with Cornwallis who detached 20 of his 33 ships of the line and sent them under Calder to find the combined fleet at Ferrol. On the 19th of August came the worrying news that the enemy had sailed from there, followed by relief when they arrived in Cadiz two days later. On the evening of Saturday 28 September, Lord Nelson joined Lord Collingwood's fleet off Cadiz, quietly, so that his presence would not be known. Battle of Trafalgar The British frigates, which had been sent to keep track of the enemy fleet throughout the night, were spotted at around 1900 hours and the order was given to form line of battle. On the morning of 21 October, the main British fleet, which was out of sight and sailing parallel some ten miles away, turned to intercept. Nelson had already made his plans, to break the enemy line some two or three ships ahead of their commander-in-chief in the centre and achieve victory before the van could come to their aid. At six o'clock hours, Nelson ordered his fleet into two columns. Fitful winds made it a slow business, and for more than six hours, the two columns of British ships slowly approached the French line before Royal Sovereign, leading the Lee Column, was able to open fire on Forgue. Around 30 minutes later, victory broke the line between the 80-gun French flagship Bucentaur and 74-gun Red Utob and fired her guns at such close range that the flames of the guns were singeing the windows of the French flagship before the shockwave and cannonballs arrived. The victory's port guns unleashed a devastating broadside, raking the Bucentaur and blowing a hole in the ship described as large enough to drive a coach and four horses through. The maelstrom of cannonballs and grape shot dismounted the Bucentaur's guns and shredded her crew, killing and wounding somewhere between 300 and 450 men of the ship's 750 to 800 man complement in a matter of seconds, putting the French flagship out of action. At a quarter past one, Nelson was shot, the fatal musket ball entering his left shoulder and lodging in his spine. He died at half past four. Such killing had taken place on Victory's quarter deck that Red Utob attempted to board her, but they were thwarted by the arrival of Elliot Harvey in the 98 gun HMS Temeraire, whose broadside devastated the French ship. Nelson's last order was for the fleet to anchor, but this was countermanded by Vice Admiral Cuthbert Collingwood. Victory suffered 57 killed and 102 wounded. Victory had been badly damaged in the battle and was not able to move under her own sail. HMS Neptune therefore towed her to Gibraltar for repairs. Victory then carried Nelson's body to England, where, after lying in state at Greenwich, he was buried in St. Paul's Cathedral on 9 January 1806. Final Years Afloat The Admiralty Board considered Victory too old, and in too great a disrepair, to be restored as a first-rate ship of the line. In November 1807 she was relegated to second-rate, with the removal of two 32-pounder cannon and replacement of her middle-deck 24-pounders with 18-pounders obtained from other laid-up ships. 
She was recommissioned as a troop ship between December 1810 and April 1811. In 1812 she was relocated to the mouth of Portsmouth Harbour off Gosport, for service as a floating depot and, from 1813 to 1817, as a prison ship. Major repairs were undertaken in 1814, including the fitting of three feet ten in metal braces along the inside of her hull, to strengthen the timbers. This was the first use of iron in the vessel structure, other than small bolts and nails. Active service was resumed from February 1817 when she was relisted as a first rate carrying 104 guns. However, her condition remained poor, and in January 1822 she was towed into dry dock at Portsmouth for repairs to her hull. Refloated in January 1824, she was designated as the Port Admiral's flagship for Portsmouth Harbour, remaining in this role until April 1830. 21st Century In November 2007, Victory's then commanding officer, Lieutenant Commander John Sivier, paid a visit to USS Constitution of the U.S. Navy, which is the world's oldest commissioned naval vessel still afloat. He met Constitution's commanding officer, Commander William A. Bullard III, and discussed the possibility of arranging an exchange program between the two ships. Listed as part of the National Historic Fleet, Victory has been the flagship of the First Sea Lord since October 2012. Prior to this, she was the flagship of the Second Sea Lord. She is the oldest commissioned warship in the world and attracts around 350,000 visitors per year in her role as a museum ship. The current and 101st commanding officer is Lieutenant Commander Brian Smith, who assumed command in May 2015. The most significant change has been on 5 March 2012 when ownership of the ship was transferred from the Ministry of Defence to a dedicated HMS Victory Preservation Trust, established as part of the National Museum of the Royal Navy. According to the Royal Navy website, the move was heralded by the announcement of a £25 million capital grant to support the new trust by the Gosling Foundation, a donation which has been matched by a further £25 million from the MOD. Thanks for watching.